<clears throat> Hello, welcome to episode 19 already, um, our Over the Limit podcast. I uh, already have somebody calling me on my phone, that's a good start. Um, so we're here um, with another guest, Yes, nobody exactly. less than uh, <clears throat> Renger van der Zande. I'll give him a short introduction. 37 years old, from the Netherlands, successful in sports car racing, mainly in IMSA. Two-day 224-hour wins, very jealous of that. Uh, a win in Petit Le Mans. <laughs> also famous for his business side, on and off the track. A good marketeer, presenter on the Dutch television. Owner of multiple multi-billion dollar companies. So <laughs> let's get more to it. Who the fuck is Ranga van der Zanden? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. How are you? Fuck is Ranger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. It's uh, Christmas time, so uh, nice time with the family and uh, off season, real off season. I think uh, motorsport goes all around the year now. So uh, uh, I think Christmas is when, when the phone is really off and nobody is, uh, everybody is at home. And then we call. <laughs> <laughs> and then you call, do you want to do a podcast on the second day of Christmas? In yeah. Holland, we actually have two days of Christmas. The first day was yesterday, second day is today. Um, we have as well, but I mean, yeah. so many people are already working, so I don't know how... Most of them, yeah. A lot of them are, still, are working again. Like, it's... we don't work, obviously, but we never really work, so... No, it's different. <laughs> My girlfriend you, has to you work guys as are well. like, You guys are like family, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> so sorry for interrupting your... Um, your Christmas uh, Christmas holidays, but yeah, there's not much ho- that's not much holidays anymore nowadays because in like in two weeks, three weeks, we already leave for Daytona, so I guess it's the same for you. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's all all year round, and um, yeah, I think if you look at the racing, like Dubai, twenty four hours is in January, sure. but uh, Daytona is then Bathurst, it, uh, Sebring, it's it just all year round. You can race golf twelve hours in the December still. Um, yeah. all kinds of races all over the world you can keep racing whenever you want so uh and and big races as well it's not like a winter championship or something it's no. uh, so um <clears throat> but no. it's nice it's a nice way to i think you know also sometimes you forget like all the organizations behind the teams are so big with so many families behind um they 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 even more deserve a holiday time like this so uh yeah i think we shouldn't complain about it No, I think it's good and bad because we all, I think, want to race everywhere every day. But sometimes, you know, when you travel a lot, you want some time at home as well. But still, I mean, the fact that we can race pretty much all over the world the whole year around. Uh, I remember back in Formula 3 when you were sitting four months at home, it was also not what you wanted. So Yeah, true, true. So, yeah. Let's get to it. So, Renge, um... How did you start your career? Um, Is it uh, family related? Did your dad race as well? Or how did you get into driving cars or, well, starting go-karts, I guess? Yeah, um, my dad was into racing a little bit as an amateur. Um, He kind of like uh, hidden all the trophies and helmets uh, far away uh, because he knew if my son sees that, uh, (laughs) that might be a bit of an issue that he wants to go racing as well. So, um, but uh, exactly that happened. Uh, I saw the trophies and we were watching Formula One on TV. And um, uh, when I was five years old or six years old, I came to to my school and I met a boy whose dad was also racing. My dad wasn't even racing anymore, but his dad was still also racing. Um, and that dad got me to the go-kart track one, one, one yeah. afternoon. And um, so your dad was very happy. That hooked me up. <laughs> <laughs> so my dad was not very happy. Um, and it was actually Yelmer Buurman, his uh, his oh, yeah. dad, who uh, oh. who I was I was in the same school as Yelmer, and um, his dad took me to the go kart track, and that's how it all kind of started. But my my dad was like, uh, uh, "We're not going to do that." Um, his 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 words are, "I don't like those little kids. If they don't win the race, they throw the helmet on the <laughs> on the floor." Um, Fair enough. So we're gonna build our own. Uh, that's you, Lawrence. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I once had it through my helmet on the floor, but that was a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so we built our own, like car with a moped engine, and uh, I was driving around the neighborhood, going on two wheels and into the into the bush bush. Um, if I missed the corner, so it was kind of getting dangerous. And then my mom said at the end, like I was already 11 years old. My mom at the end said. 
please go and uh, buy a go-kart for the guy because it's going to be an obsession at one point and that's how it all started yeah okay and then you um if i remember right because that's my first memory of you with uh, driving with crg holland with the bright yellow uh helmet um so then you went go-karting for a while quite professional i guess right yeah i think um you know in the beginning it was my dad who was my mechanic and looking back um that was a beautiful time you know you uh you had your your dad starting up firing up your engine and you would just go racing and it was just him and me um trying to uh trying to win races and it was a local championship um and we were uh we were far from professional we had a little little you know toolbox and um sometimes we bought some new tires but not every time um and we were actually some people started to say hello to us like hello and um and we found out like towards the end of the season that uh, we were leading the championship um so uh we won that championship local championship in venrai a very small um place in holland okay which uh, i did a lot of laps at that track and then we went to Fasirka with crg holland like you say that's mm -hmm. when when we went trade for the full shebang actually my dad was pretty good at um at finding sponsorships so he found found some sponsorship to go you know international we did the european championship um the world cup uh we did um with crg and at the end it was a it was a fun time to 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 learn how to drive and to learn how racing is and for me it was a overwhelming world which i i really wanted to be part of and i loved it um I wouldn't say I was the greatest go-karter, but I, I did finish fifth at the World Cup or, um, that, yeah. you know, won some races. And But I, I was never, like, outstanding. I was just enjoying the moment being at the racetrack because I finally could go go-karting. Yeah. Where, um, you know, so um, that's how the go-kart went. And, yeah, then from there on, um, we, uh, we had a big problem because, um, <laughs> you know, if you go car racing, your, your budget will double. <laughs> if it's not triple um so we had to find a lot of money to go racing there and my uh, my dad said okay you know how my dad is kind of like um typical university guy so he's made a whole study out of what you do and what kind of team and so on we, we ended up with fernando sport racing who's like uh, mm -hmm. the professor in uh, in holland about racing yeah. you know he's uh, you drove for him yeah that's so where i started as well uh, and yeah. i did some i did a simulator test uh or oh, did some simulator days there, but I never did a, I never did Formula Three, so I, I, I never drove, I never drove there. Just make it short. Oh. So I, I think I'm two years older than you, Lawrence, isn't it? Uh, no, you're a lot older than that. Uh, five. Oh. <laughs> five years older, yeah. <laughs> I'm thirty-two. Yeah. Okay. No, but we had, okay, we yeah. have. I mean, I think we are like. Uh, generation is a big word, but a couple of years apart. Let's say a class apart, but we did quite similar like i also drove for crg holland with Vasirka, and then i also started with van amersfoort with fritz yep. so quite similar people how did you enjoy starting working with fritz because i remember it very well as it was yesterday yes. yeah i mean fritz is a is a teacher you know? yeah you listen to him and um it's uh there's, there's no bullshit with fritz he's yeah. um he's there to to make you better and if you don't uh if you don't work, you're kind of like uh, on the exit door already. Mm. Um, but uh, he's a he's a very analytical guy, and he's really um, I wouldn't say uh, he, he's not the most positive guy in the no. world. But that's why he's <laughs> uh, he's good in what he does. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's why he's good in what he does because he, you know, he's there to uh, to win races and to uh, to teach people. I also remember because I I did my first years in cars with Fritz, and it's in my memory it's one of the most fun years I had because I don't know if Rick Vernoy, he was the engineer. Yeah. Uh, I was literally going by train to their workshop in, in Van Amersfoort. Um, yeah. He doesn't own the city, he just lives there. But, uh, <laughs> and I literally slipped on, on the couch uh, with Rick, my engineer, and then went to the workshop. And back then, Formula 3, everything was open. So I, I remember we I was doing the stuff myself, like closing the rear bonnet, you know, because he had cooling fins. And if you would close them, it would be more dynamically and some uh, good you cars. You could do what added. you want back yeah. then. And I was doing the, was together with Rick, like the, the carbon coding and, and learning all of that. And it was, 
It's yeah. fun. It's really learned a lot. And also it was a very fam family team and a real family team because nowadays every brand and every team says they're a family team, but yeah, it's not always <laughs> but I, the reality. Uh, rich families. Yeah. yeah. I never, I never, I mean, I never worked with Fritz. I, I, I saw from you and I, I saw how he also learned other drivers uh, to, you know, to perform well. But I don't know if there's anyone still like those people. You know, I, I know Fritz, for example, is one guy like this. And I know um, Josef Kaufmann from Kaufmann Racing. Yeah. He yeah, is yeah. a similar guy, I think. He, but he doesn't exist anymore, does he? They, you know, they, they stopped. Yeah. But I remember I did one, I did a Formula Renault season there and I made a few mistakes when he told me not to do this and this and <laughs> I came back in the in the box and he was like, fuck, what are you doing? And like, but it's, I don't think they do it like this anymore today, which... It's more uh, business it's, now. No, yeah, it's, it's, which is a shame, I think. It, it, I think it's, uh, un, unfortunately, I think one of the junior series is a Richmond sports now. So yeah. if you... Yeah. It's so expensive, and uh, Fritz the same with me. You know, I did a Formula Renault test, and it was started to rain at the end. And I said, you know, I want to go out with slicks in the rain. You know, I want to, I want to see how it is. And uh, Fritz was like, yes, that's fine, <laughs> but if you crash it or dump it, you're in a big, in a big tr trouble. You know. So it was just a Formula Renault, Renault car at the time, and of course, I dumped it in the gravel. <laughs> um, in turn one in Zandvoort and the, the car was covered with like sand and it was the last five minutes of the session so the car came back and Fritz said you tomorrow nine o'clock you take off the floor yeah my mechanics are not going to clean this up and I, uh, I was there at nine o'clock and uh exactly. covered with sand all my eyes were covered with you know full of sand and that was one of the things that um Fritz teach you that if things happen that actually there's a consequence and mm -hmm. um, the consequence is that my mechanic is going to be f covered full of dirt. And uh, <laughs> he, he was teaching me that the next time you dump it in the gravel, you know, what's uh, what the consequence is. So, you know, those kind of things, I think in junior categories, that's what you learn as a driver and what you take for the rest of your career, where nowadays, I think that's not, uh, I don't, like you say, Dries, I don't know many team bosses who are as, as hard to the drivers as, as yeah. they were. And, you know, this is one example. There's many more I can tell you, but um, but nowadays yeah. they'll and tell you if you crash it, and... you'll get a big bill. That's the thing they'll they'll tell you today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I do think that if the car was crashed, also Fritz would have sent me a bill. Yeah, but, probably. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. It's a Richmond sport right now because the, yeah. the budgets are double of what we're used to. Pay it's crazy at the moment. For Formula Renault, yeah. and um, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a shame. So uh, I think you know. Young talent, you're almost um, better off going for a small GT series or something like that than Formula series to to learn how to drive. And I, I really, you know, the th same thing with Fritz. The 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 way I got taught how to drive a race car, I still do the same now yeah. in every car that I drive. So the the base that I the 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 basis of driving that I got at Fritz from Amersfoort Racing is still uh, still active. Yeah, we should get him on the podcast. That would be an yeah. interesting. A I lot mean, of interesting stories. Yeah. I'm not sure he would tell everything in a funny way, but <laughs> no, he would be too. He would be serious. But still, it would be very interesting. I spoke to him this year in Zandvoort. He's yeah. uh, he told me he's he sold the company and he's retiring. So really, uh, oh. I think he has plenty of time to uh, not to sleeping in a truck anymore. <laughs> Yeah, he loves to drive his truck. That's what he likes. So it's good to yeah. have him bring him, bring him, do a podcast in the truck. That would be a good idea. <laughs> I, I always see, I, because we are friends on Facebook, I always see him going completely nuts on Facebook when there is a road thing or when there's traffic jams and they, they block the road for his truck. So he gets he gets completely crazy yeah, on yeah. Facebook. <laughs> yeah, like Renga said, he's not the most, in a good way, but he's not the most positive guy on, yeah. on the planet, maybe. <laughs> no, he's a pessimist for yeah. sure. Yeah. So after that, you uh, you spent some years in Formula Three. Uh, I think you did German Formula Three, Euro Series, and uh, UK. Um, yeah. How did that go? I think you were a Mercedes Junior driver yeah. at that point as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think Mercedes always helped me in the Junior Series, and um, you know they gave me an engine or some budget to 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 help part of the budget. And I think the budget part I'll come back about later on how that was when I uh, kind of like was done in 2012. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, we um, have a question about that anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, you know, Formula 3 is um, is super important f for you, for me, for how to learn to work with uh, work working on a setup. We had a lot of testing days that you could go 
you know, play around with your car and your setup and your engineer to to find out um, how things work in most in, in in the setup in the uh, within a car. I did a German Formula Three team uh, from Seifert. I was racing for them, mm -hmm. Seifert, Rüdiger Seifert. They yep. um, they spoke uh, German only, so my I had to learn how to speak German. So I spoke German with them about setup, about life, about everything. Uh, but they were from the east of Germany, so then I came. After that year of racing, I came to Stuttgart for Mercedes and I started to speak German and nobody understood me. <laughs> and I couldn't, I couldn't understand that either because the dialect was so strong yeah. in the east of Germany that I was an East Eastern Germany speaking um, guy at that point. So I had to switch over and get to normal German again, I guess. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, Formula 3, I was driving for Prema, Prema Power Team, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, uh, they came from a very successful period with Ryan Briscoe and Toyota and all those junior teams. I came to the team when it was not going so well. So I think I was the only driver at the time who signed up with them. Yeah. Um, they also budget related. They gave me uh, the only deal in the paddock that, that I could kind of like not afford, but make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, and we finished fourth in the championship in 2008, which was, uh, well, not too bad. It was Hulkeberg, Bianchi, uh, Bottas, all those, all those guys were, uh, were there. Um, but with the fourth place, it's not like a Formula One team will pick you up. So, yeah. um, I, I kind of like was in trouble at that point. I, I didn't have a budget to go racing in 2009. And, um, that was the time when Walter Gruppmuller had, uh, I think he had four engine deals, uh, five cars, uh, two trucks for one driver. And that was his son. Yeah um he had a lot of money he uh spent on the car so the car was really fast um they it was high tech right? with the formula 3 car it was high tech yeah. yeah and it was an amazing story because i was i was like trying to find any drive you know uh here in zandford or um a team from my old town jet street was a porsche super cup team where richard westbrook was driving for and they had one race where there was a clash for richard so i could do one race at least that year that i got signed up for and then um, Walter called me up, Walter Gruppmuller, and he said, like, hey, we just did the first race and uh, we were very fast. The car is very fast. He was trying to sell me how fast the car was. <laughs> and I was just trying to get into a seat. So any car I would have jumped in. But um, he called me up and he said, if you come for the second race and you help my son, uh, you're in the seat. So I, uh, I got a new helmet, went to, the, went to England. I started driving there. And it was Daniel Ricciardo who was in, this, in that uh, season the star yeah. of the the championship max chilton and some some other good drivers were there and i think we won the first race straight away um but then you so if i remember i remember race. a story of that that you you really literally were i mean you had to drive you could win races but one of the main thing was to help the son right that must have been kind yeah. of special yeah so i was leading the first race won it and then he was like oh shit, that's going a bit too fast <laughs> so the second yeah. race i was leading and then I got the radio call and they said, Hey, now you go to P5 just behind Walter. <laughs> I was like, are you serious? Exactly. So I, I dropped down and I slowed down and I let everybody buy and went behind Walter. So big, that was part of the deal, but that got me in that 2009 season. Um, so I didn't do the first weekend, which was two rounds, two, two races. And I didn't do the last weekend because I was in front of Walter in the championship at the end before the last race. <laughs> no way. <laughs> So Walter didn't call me on the radio, but he called me on the phone and said, uh, you're not coming to the last race because we want Walter to finish second in the championship and I finished third then. So I missed two race weekend and um, it was a it was a good season for my profile to because I had a very fast car and I could win races and I, you know, it was very clear that we were very fast. Um, but uh, on the other hand, the sportive wise, it was very hard to uh, slow down and let Walter by and many times. I had a match. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> I don't know if I would. I mean, yeah. Well, if you don't, have, end, a, if you don't, don't have a if, choice, if it's, it's, it's quite yeah, easier. Then you, I mean, yeah, it's what, yeah. But still, fuck it. <laughs> it's but didn't tough. that didn't that team then get bought by uh, Mazepin's father? High tech GP? No, I think you're right. Now it's owned by Mazepin's father. Um, but I think for a few it was Ryan Sharp who continued with it okay. for two or three years. And then I'm not sure what happened. Um, Maybe it was already Mazepin at that time, but... Because um, same goes for, for sure Prema, right? Prema is owned by Strolls. Oh, they, they, don't, they still 
they sold it. Partly, I think. Yeah. They sold it, and mm. now it's... Um, we had the first... I got invited for the 40 years of Prema, and it's quite impressive. And now it's Iron it Links. It's a big party in... Uh, ah, yeah, true. And now it's owned by Iron Links, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Ah, so. yeah, yeah, true. I see yeah. no more family teams. do a good teams, job. Huh? Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, what? So no more family teams. That's all business nowadays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, the same thing with uh, MP Bautersport. It's a junior team here in um, yeah. in Holland. Who um, I was talking to them about the insurances, and they do two Formula Two cars, three Formula Threes. They do six Formula Four in the Spanish, six Formula Four in the Jesus. Formula Academy, and it's it's amazing how big these teams got at the um, yeah. right now. They talk to Red Bull Racing. Uh, Renault, Alpine, um, all the junior teams are involved there. So, yeah, I guess it's, it's the only way for them to teams are involved. to survive nowadays is to have so many cars and to be having seats sold to Red Bull, Mercedes, uh, all the Formula One junior teams. I guess. Yeah, I guess because yeah. I mean, old life just gets more and more expensive. You have to get all the people everywhere, bring all the cars everywhere. <clears throat> But I also heard that nowadays uh, to get into junior teams, you can also just buy yourself in it. Like you can yeah. just buy yourself into a Red Bull junior thing. Well, Red Bull, I'm not sure, but like Ferrari is, I think it's quite known that you can buy yourself into that. No? Well, you can buy yourself yeah, into it's everything. A shame, huh? <laughs> yeah, nowadays. It would can. be nice. Like, um, honestly, I think today, if you want to do a junior career, you need to be a girl. Well, if if you're a girl and you know how to drive, you definitely. But have if a you very can drive, chance. yeah, for sure, you are. You you can be. You can get in. Hundred percent. I got a son and a girl, and I told the son, <laughs> "You can forget about it." <laughs> I told Lola, my my daughter. She's getting you want to go racing. <laughs> we can make it happen. So. No, but, but um, I mean, no, seriously. It's true. Yeah, I think the the right now the Formula Academy. I think it's the the girls. Uh, championship I think everybody's like most of the people are uh, most of the girls are driving for free there it's all invest in, investment by uh, I think next year the the junior category every Formula 1 team has to support two cars in the in the junior category in the same weekend so it's yeah. it's proper money involved now to get a girl on the grid in Formula 1 I think so maybe you should speak to Emily as well and forget about horses <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, then I'm, then I'm, I thought I'm good with get rid of you Lawrence at one point but I guess we're on the go-kart track soon then <laughs> uh, shouting against you fuck no my daughter was quick no. <laughs> I'm but my kids I mean you can never say no but like you said I'm trying as well to see it a bit as the on the business side of things as well because I mean that's what it is and unless you have x amount of euros dollars uh ready to go for it I don't see the sense of starting with it because then after already nowadays, a couple of years of carding, you're like, okay, and what do we do now? And you know, back in the day, you could see solutions like your father did or, or, or other guys. But nowadays with those budgets, I mean, you spend three, 400,000 euros for a year of international go-karting. Um, yeah. I mean, and I don't, I don't want to know what nowadays Formula 3 and Formula 2 costs. That's not... <laughs> That's not anymore. I'll 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 I'll, I'll call my contacts and 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 figure it out, <laughs> uh, or put a mortgage well, on the house like people used to do 30, 40 years ago. Um, so yeah, I'm a bit pessimistical on that yeah, part. But yeah, if she really wants to go racing, she'll I'll give her the chance. But maybe more in like uh, small cars thing when she's 14, 15 years old, and then try and become a professional later on, like the things we do. Instead of burning go kart and Formula Three money into Augusto uh, is trying his he, his daughter wants wanted to race and yeah. now she started to do go kart racing and I think she won her or she got on the podium last weekend um, and she's oh, wow. racing every weekend yeah. and apparently she's doing yeah, she's doing sure. good but it's let's see uh, like, we should talk to him if how it goes <laughs> sure. but yeah yeah no it's super interesting uh, I also spoke to Augusto and. Uh, I think he's he's close with uh, Susie, Susie Wolf, and mm, uh, okay. obviously Susie is the one who is pushing very hard for the woman in motorsport. Yeah, and um, she's doing an amazing job there, by the way. And I think uh, I think she got in the ear of Augusto saying like, "Hey, if you want to yeah. make a career in motorsport, you have to start with the girl, not the boy." Um, and the girl is like, uh, he put it, he put her on a go kart in Lonato in the Winter Cup, like the biggest field of the junior categories, <laughs> and just say. 
off you go. I think she flipped once already, but she wasn't impressed. And okay. uh, she got ready. But I think it's cool to get Augusto about this. You know, it's very nice that you guys get uh, people on the podcast um, who are already kind of like established in motorsport because I think it's very nice for young drivers to hear how careers yeah. develop and yeah. how they... There's never a straight path. There's always... Nope. You know, I call it... Um, you know, the ice blocks in the sea, I always call it jump from one ice block to the other ice block to survive. Yeah. And um, you never know if there's going to be another ice block, you know. So it's nice if you can people on the on the podcast and young drivers can maybe uh, learn from the crazy stuff that we did to get, get into racing. It's not that easy. No, exactly. I think that was a, a one of my next points. And I think you're a perfect example of that because... I think the years which you described so far in Formula 3, you did one more year, I think, in DTM. And then you you had a pretty difficult moment in your career. But looking where you are today, one of the, I mean, the reference guys uh, in, in sports car racing, you survived that period. It would be interesting to hear how that went and, and how you you got back up there in the end. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty crazy story where um, there were... You know, Formula 3 at the time was a 500,000 euro budget. Mm -hmm. um, to, and I did it two years. Uh, and another year in Formula 3 Germany, which was half of that budget, let's say. So there was proper money to be found by us to, to go racing. And my dad didn't have that money. My family doesn't have that money. So my dad was good in finding sponsorship, but maybe half of it. Then we got a bit of the sponsorship from Mercedes to to help it. But there was still a bit, a bit of budget that um, that wasn't there. And we still wanted to go racing and um i have to say my dad is really good in finding sponsorships and and you know getting things done and moving forward let's say uh living the dream but also there was um in 2011 i did dtm and in 2012 i was um i had no seed no uh no future and i had a million of debt um Shit. well not on my bank account so there was quite a little of um yeah, quite a big. I was quite in the shit. Let's put it that way. Um, there was some contracts with 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 sponsors that said, you know, it's not a sponsorship; it's an investment. So mm -hmm. I, I hear you stop racing, so uh, I'm gonna send you my bill for what I what you still owe me. Shit. And um, <laughs> yeah, I was I was in trouble, and um, I, I basically I could have done two things. One is uh, lie on my back and say, hey, there's nothing to be found here. Sorry, but uh, Go and look somewhere else or a second is uh, let me let me solve this issue let me try to solve this issue and that's what i did i i spoke to everyone who uh, who had still pay some money back and i started a business i um together with dennis van der Laar, his father ronald van der Laar, mm -hmm. who um who is very successful in in the, in the insurance business normal insurance business i said like hey i know the world of racing very well i, I have a lot of contacts there um you know the world of insurance why don't we combine it and see if we can start a business because I'm in trouble. Um, do you want to help me? And he said, yeah, okay, let's go. I'll, I'll help you out and let's start this business. So, um, you know, coming from DTM, I felt quite like a big guy, um, you know, um, I didn't when I came, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking a little, but it is like, if you're on the level of DTM and then you have to go back to a paddock to sell insurances, walk into a pit, box and say hey i'm ranger um and i'm trying to sell you an insurance here it, i for me it was a, a quite a step to go there uh -huh. and say you know um go over my ego but i i quickly found out that everybody was really happy to see me and say yeah of course um we we are looking for an insurance so i'm happy you're stepping in here so it quickly turned into a very nice way to speak to all the race teams and um um because of that I started the business, the business went well, um, quickly, we started to make money, but on top of it, I was speaking to all the race teams in Europe, yeah. um, about their racing. And they said, Hey, are you not racing anymore? Why are you not racing anymore? If you want to race next Sunday in Paul Ricard in my GT, um, Mercedes AMG GT, um, we need a driver and, um, we, we, we think you're pretty good. So. Let's give it a go. I said, hey, I have no budget. I don't want to do the insurance for free because that's the first thing they ask, of course, <laughs> um, because that's my business. Uh, I have other problems to solve. And then um, they put me in the car. I said, I'll pay my own hotel and my flight and I'm happy to go racing. And um, But 
just to remind you, I stopped racing, so um, I'm happy to do it as a hobby. And I jumped in the car and I did some GT Open races that year and um, put it on pole once and maybe on the podium a few times. And that's how I got a call from America. And in America, it was uh, Mirko Schulte, a German guy who uh, was racing LMPC at the time. LMPC was like LMP2 is now yeah. in the IMSA championship. And um, Mirko said, hey, we're racing in Laguna Seca. I need a driver. Do you want to do it? If you pay your hotel and your flight, you can come and race. And I looked at my bank account. And I was like, <laughs> that's it. it's not possible. <laughs> so I told Mirko, like, I can pay my flight. I had 3,000 euro on my bank account. And I, my flight was 1,500. And I said, like, shit, I need to do this. This is Laguna Seca. You know, uh, like every guy, you play this on the PlayStation, Laguna Seca all yeah. the time. So it was a dream come true to go to Laguna Seca. And I said, if you do the hotel, I'll do the flight and we're off we go. And, and that's how I, you know, the bottleneck of going into the U S racing was right there. So, um, um, since then I stayed in the U S racing in the U S and the year after I, I started to make money, Peter Baron took over the program yeah. from Mirko and Peter oh, yeah, Baron. No. Well, Star Wars was Wars motorsport, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. He was the first one who paid me a salary to go racing. And I was like, let's go. And, um, so it was, uh, yeah, that, that's a, that's a bit of my story. Um, how I, uh, how I managed to go through and, and now I still have a business and I'm still racing on the highest level of, of uh, sports car racing. So I'm very, very fortunate to, uh, to, to, to make it through that bottleneck to go back into it. But that's also how I remember you from, even from a tree that you, like you said, what your dad was doing, but I think you have the same that you always had a business mind and a marketing mind, because I remember from the tree, you saw these stickers saying, I said it as a joke, but who the fuck is Ranger? They were everywhere on the toilet, yeah. under the toilet, <laughs> on all the signs. Yeah. And, uh, but it was smart in the beginning, you're like, what the fuck is this? But then uh, when you think about it now, it's, it's, it's smart. And I think that's also one of the reasons probably why you went through that phase where a lot of others probably would have given up and, uh, and stayed on the couch. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think I learned a lot from my dad on that point. He's uh, he's a consultant for companies, and um, you know you don't get rich by uh, consulting, but it's uh, he's a clever man. And yeah. he, one of the things he did very well was was that marketing aspect of uh, going racing. I think we were not so racing smart, you know, career wise and all that. It's we made our best choices to go to our you know to our knowledge. But I think on the marketing side and all the you know getting partners involved and all that it was good and it's a funny story with the stickers of the you know a lot of people let me see if i can find a helmet here that still has it on the back but um or a sticker but it's um it's who the fuck is right let me let me find it <laughs> we should do a giveaway people like the giveaway we did in the last episode yeah. so let's give if you have some left we should do a who the fuck is ranger sticker Give it. Yeah, exactly. Who the fuck is Ranger? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was actually this helmet when we um, when I was in Formula Three, and you know, you see, it's full of sponsorships. Yeah. And uh, this one was paying a little. This one was one of those investors. Um, but um, oh, I yeah, know that. Who the fuck is Ranger? That is. Ah. Uh, it's also a sponsor who helped Jos uh, or yeah. Jos Sapper and his Formula One days. Does he? What's the name again of him? Because I'm. It's on the tip of my tongue, but. It's just Peridon, Peridon, and um, the real estate guy, lawyer. And they they kind of did an investment. The big, the biggest, the coolest sponsor I have is Q Dance and Sensation White. Because <laughs> you could go party they, for, uh, not, for they, free. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was 18 years old and like going flat out on the parties because they <laughs> they organize like they get like a football stadium full of people, 40,000 people, the best DJs of the world, and they go partying. And that's how they um, and they they've been a big backbone of my career. Because they basically said, the owner said, you know, we'll give you X amount of money every year and you can do whatever you want with it. But um, it was like the base of my uh, my budget to go racing at the time. But who the fuck is Renger is funny because there's one other guy in the paddock who is called Reinhold Renger. His last name is Renger. Okay. And at one point he was sitting in Hockenheim on the toilet and he looked up <laughs> and he said, who the fuck is Renger? <laughs> and it was his own name and he, he like had to figure out that there was someone else in the paddock as well with uh, it was smart with Ranger on the name so yeah but like you say you know it's uh I always had to work hard to make things happen and um at the time it looked and that's the thing 
young people of this world who want to go racing. It looks much more fancier than it than you really hear the yeah, than you <laughs> when you hear the real story. You know, we all have this Instagram, which is yeah. fantastic, full of like great pictures and videos and all that. Mm. But if you want to hear the whole story and go to this podcast, <laughs> and listen to the people who have the real <laughs> the real story. Good that. <laughs> Um, but then you, yeah, you rebounded, uh, your career in, in the U S, um, mainly in IMSA. Um, what do you, what do you like so much about the, the championship or like IMSA? Yeah. What I like about IMSA is that, you know, it's, um, it's bad to say it, but it's almost a club level of racing feeling, <laughs> but on yeah. the highest level of hillbilly racing. racing. <laughs> yeah. What? Hillbilly racing. Hillbilly racing. It's no, maybe a it's bit extreme, but no, it's. I mean, it's very. I mean, it's a very. It's a very good series, but I, I think I, I understand what you mean. It's very club level feeling because we're all in the tent eating, you know, yeah. with all the mechanics, the drivers. It's a. It's very um, attractive for a fan to go to. So if you want, you can interrupt the pit stop. You know, you can jump over the wall and <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and interrupt the pit stop if you like. You know, it's. I don't give anyone ideas here but it's um it's so approachable it's so nice the boss of IMSA is John Doonan he's a fantastic guy you know True. he's at the ticket box giving me a high five happy you're here you know yeah. if you go to the WAC you feel like yeah another championship you feel like you're not welcome at all so it, you know I, I really like the it's very approachable it's very nice but at the same time it's I feel it's the best racing in the world because you know an endurance race is good after half an hour become pretty boring yeah. you know it's just cars going in circles but in IMSA with the safety cars there's always some action always some excitement always people finding and you know um bumping into each other for position so you have to be very clever to survive in a way in mm -hmm. IMSA because if you if you race too hard you're not gonna make it till the end of the race on top of it the level of drivers and it's gotten a lot better but in the top there's really good drivers like Alonso, Castro Neves, uh, uh, Montoya, all the big names are racing in IMSA, but in the low end of the grid, there are some, you know, dentists, lawyers <laughs> who come up with a big bag of money and buy their seat into a, into a race car. Yeah. So it could get pretty, pretty dirty and nasty at, uh, when you, when you have that multi-class racing, which I think is very interesting and yeah. it's very nice to survive. So I really like that championship for the, for the sportive side of of things and uh, the atmosphere in the paddock is just uh, i'm also a big big fan of that. of imsa for all those reasons because it's like you said it's the most fun for sure because it's the most relaxed in a way the best racing in a way i i also i did also start to respect WEC a lot more than i used to in the past because it is, like you said, it is a bit more of a professional series because it's a FIA World Championship and it's maybe more pure about performance because you don't have those safety cars. So we would say it's maybe a tiny bit more pro, but IMSA is for sure. I always said if I've won what I want to win and I want to end my career and have the most fun I ever have, I'm no doubt uh, full-time back in IMSA because it is. I love yeah. being in America. The racing's fun. It's relaxed. You accept uh, the clubhouse feeling so um but also i think that's why it works so well if you look in general in, in the u.s racing nascar indycar yeah. it's all very approachable the people can go to the cars they can touch the cars they can stand next to it in in WEC or in, in other championships in europe they are so controlled that you can't get close to the cars and i think it's a it's a yeah it's a very good point that they use like if you look at daytona with at the grid that all the people can stand next to it it's completely crazy how busy it is but that's why the people that's why i think there are so many people coming to the racetracks always uh, in imsa at, at least yeah it's uh it's sold out already uh, two years in a row daytona sebring yeah. all those uh petit Le Mans, it's all sold out because it's you know people come to the racing but also you know i love the fans in america they come up to you and say hey they're mm. so respectful yeah, yeah. and say, Hey, how are you doing? And, uh, having a little chat and, uh, they know more about you than, than they would even tell you, but, um, they come up to you and say, Hey, how are you doing? Um, I've been watching your racing for the last 10 years. It's like, Oh really? <laughs> um, and, um, I'm here with my friends for already seven years camping and barbecuing and all, all around the track. We see you go and uh, fight each other. And yeah. I remember that move. I remember that yeah. move. So they're really into it, you know? So 
It's um, the camping ground over there. We have some friends. Actually, are you both in Daytona? Yeah. 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 We sh you should meet them. They are um, they are big friends of Simon Pagino as well, mm -hmm. and they go, always go to the big races. They have a a, a, a camping place with a couple of friends. Let's say ten friends with a few campers, and uh, one of them is a chef cook. It's the most amazing food you will ever taste. It's not so difficult in America but, <laughs> uh, to beat that Fair food, point. but uh, at the same time, at the same time, they make amazing food and they they just having the time of their life with friends uh, around the racetrack. And you know, many race car drivers uh, over the years got got to their place and say, uh, you know, having a good time after the race or uh, on a, on a Friday night having dinner with those guys. So it's it's that's how close we are with the friends exactly. in America, with the fans in America. They are they're more like our friends than. Than, uh, than keeping them on the distance. Yeah. No, that's true. So yeah, you, you're very successful there. You had two Daytona wins. Like I said, I'm jealous about it. I want one at one point at least. Um, interesting, and this is a genuine question you from my side. Watch, like, you should have wear the watch and show it to Lawrence, <laughs> like, here you go, man. Well, you should have showed it to Jacqueline because <laughs> I wouldn't be able to wear it. Um, you've won Daytona with uh, nobody less than Fernando Alonso. Um, obviously when he's with us in the paddock, you know, he's a big name, so we respect him, but he's, he's one of the, the, the other drivers, uh, like, 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 like you and me. Um, but there was a huge amount of, uh, outside talk that he was, uh, seriously amazing in some conditions in, in, in the race and so on. Was it that, like that? How was it from, because, you know, what people say, what the reality was, or how was he to work with? Was it so special? Was it, is it exceptional? Um, would, I was generally interested to, to know the true, the true story about that. Yeah, it's, it's because a often, question, I think. Because often somebody comes in from the outside, and, I mean, it's not that they are doing double the job as, as we do, but... And the talks from the outside is always are always different than the talks from the inside. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's interesting with Fernando, who was uh, it was me, Kobayashi, Jordan Taylor, and Fernando. So four guys on the car, and um, obviously he came in with uh, two brand new helmets and um, always Kabarak here and all that. It's yeah. the big Formula One guy arrived, sure. you know. And um, I would say uh, there's two things of it. One is the driving, and one is him um, behaving in the team. Yeah. And uh, if you look at the driving, it was me and Jordan sitting on the pit stand, how you sit in America, right? Uh -huh. On the pit stand, you're watching it. Jordan came in after a new set of tires, jumps out of the car. Fernando goes in the car for the first time. He goes out, and within two laps, purple, purple. Jordan and me looking at each other like, oh, my God. And then he got traffic, so he didn't beat the lap time. At least he didn't beat the lap time, right? Okay. Um, that's already so impressive. So it was very clear <laughs> that within two laps, he was on the pace. He was right there and he knew exactly where to find the grip. And that's, but then if you look at the averages and if you look at the lap times, and it was very equal between all the four drivers. But I think what makes him very special is that he finds the grip within one lap, within two quarters. So, you know, turn three in Daytona, mm -hmm. the grip changes a lot. Sometimes it's yeah. on the inside, sometimes it's on the outside. He was always the first one to find the right line. So that that's what makes him special. I don't think um, he's that much faster. I don't think he's that much. Um, you know, we're equal on the lap times. I, I think I was even faster. You know, um, mm -hmm. if you look at the average from uh, the B pillar that everybody watched. But it's more that whenever there's something changes, he's the first one who finds it. And like his stand in the rain, where everybody time. spoke about then at night. Exactly. Yeah, those kind of moments is where he makes the difference. And it's just the gut feeling or the butt feeling, whatever you call yeah. it, um, that he has is uh, is very special. And then if you look at Jordan and I spoke about it, I think last year as well about it, and I forgot about it a bit again. But he would come in after after practice, and he would say uh, to to Kamui, who was getting in the car at that time, he would come in and say, "Hey, take it easy, yeah, because we can at least one and a half seconds go faster. <laughs> take it easy." So Kobayashi goes out. You know, no way to go. He was like, "Oh shit, I'm I'm in trouble. I must be very slow today." You know, <laughs> so playing those mental games. Yeah, I think Fernando was also one of the the worst. Let's say, put it that the best or the worst, whatever you want to call it. Uh, um, yeah, Formula One style. I guess that's Formula One style. Yeah. And, you know, I he came in and he's like, "I can do one and a half seconds faster." I said, 
that's awesome. <laughs> we have a great teammate on board, you know. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm just happy if my teammate is very fast, but um, that's not how uh, how it works in Formula One, obviously. Uh, no, for sure, he's supernatural. If not, he would not be there where he, where he is now, and uh, or at least be at that age. Yeah, uh, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised to what you said now that he has a a gift of of finding a grip within three corners. Uh, and probably being quicker on the pace than than me or Dries, and that's why or you, and that's why he's in, in Formula One and a double world champion. Um, but yeah, often in the end when they come like with the, all the others, they have that natural ability. But it's not that they drive a second quicker than than everybody else. No, not at all. And I think <laughs> if you look at Fernando uh, when he's in Formula One, the, in Formula One there's a very short period of time to perform. Exactly. There's always. Yeah. You know, you go out for pre-practice and if you can find your balance and your grip within the first 10 minutes of a session, you have another 50 minutes to work on the car. If you need half an hour, you only have half an hour yeah. to work on the car. So that you bring that into the race weekend in Formula 1. We have a lot more time sure. to, work, to you know, even in the race. If you, I, I've had races where I had four laps in the car before I go into the race. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter because in the race, there's plenty of time to figure it out. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's true. That is very true. Um, you're also very active next to the racetrack. Um, tell us a, more about those multi-billion uh, companies that you that you own and that you run. Well, it's um, it's mainly Pagona Insurance, which is uh, obviously I told you the story of how I got there. So I'm I'm very proud to to run that company. Uh, the first of January this year, 2023, I. I started really for myself. Pagona is only one year old, but I've been doing it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, we do many drivers. We do um, 50 drivers around the paddocks ah. for Formula One. Sorry to interrupt. This Pagona is then is what on it's what it was always. Oh, fuck no, sorry, it's what always is on the car on the and the uh, what's the team called again? Um, the team of the dad Jordan's dad, Wayne Taylor. Yeah, that's what's Wayne always Taylor on the car. Then that's the insurance company. No, no, no. I never, I've never been on the car of Jordan or uh, Wayne Taylor Racing, oh. but um, Pagona, we do no. have some stickers on some no. cars. Okay, never mind. I was <laughs> drunk. <laughs> no, Dries, we, we want to be on your helmet, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Two euros and it'll be on. <laughs> <Two years. laughs> no, we do, we do uh, obviously, Kevin Magnussen was my teammate for one year and he's, he's one of our clients now as well. Um, as a drivers, um, we do Earl Bamber, a uh, friend of your show. Yeah. Uh, Nicky Katzberg, many drivers around the Augusto Farfus. I'm um, still waiting on my offer are... for next year, by the way. I mean, it's been a week. It's now. in my email. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> and I actually made a, I asked for an offer for both of you. So we can ah, see okay. how that works. Ah. But uh, we do the Iron Dames, the girls yeah. uh, for Iron Links. Uh, we do Iron Links as a team. We do some insurances for that. but. The, the driver side is something that I, I like to do because I want to make sure my racing uh, friends have the best deal in the paddock to yeah. me. I love to do that. Yeah. But my main business is the race cars. So my race cars, the race car insurance is, um, is what my focus is. And we do many cars around Europe. Uh, we do some in the US. MDK is a good team that we, uh, that we work with. Yeah. with is Mark Fame, yeah. who um, Anders Fjordbach with High Class is a, is a, is a we work close together with them. Um, but it's, it's one year that we've been rolling into the Pagona brand, let's say, a new company. And it's, um, it's really cool. I've got three guys full time working for me now, um, which is um, another new way of uh, living, I would say, almost. You know, you feel responsible for those guys. You're and, a boss now. Um, <laughs> I'm a boss now. Yeah, I'm not I remember. This is a very funny story. The, everybody remembers the year on Macau, I think it was 2017, where there was the big, big pileup. Oh, ah, yeah. Where no, 20... Oh, yeah, 17. Yes. 17, where, I don't know the, the corner name, but all the cars went to each other. It's on YouTube. And I mean, we all got out of the car, all the drivers, because all the cars were on top of each other and we were standing there like, holy shit, what's this? And at one point, you know, we don't own the cars. It doesn't cost us money. So we started like not laughing about it, but kind of making jokes like fucking hell, this is insane. Yes. And, but there was one guy who was not laughing. He was kind of sitting in the corner and was crying. He <laughs> was Ranger because he was securing a couple of, of the cars that were standing there. And that was uh, the first memory I of your insurance I had. 15, the 15 cars that 
that were in that crash, I think 12 of them were insured with me. So I was not having, and my car was in the middle of it. So I jumped out of the car and I just like, oh my, oh, what just happened? It was not a good day for me. You might be running to all the car. You have big damage. Let me check. Yeah, let me take pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Write it down. I remember this year no, you um, you insured uh, my car in Macau, um, the the Porsche. And I remember you was texting me every day, hey, Lawrence, watch out, Lawrence, <laughs> be careful, <laughs> <laughs> don't do anything stupid. But it's good to know when are we costing you money and when are you earning money when we don't. Crash? Yeah, so basically it's like this: we've got insurance companies who back us up. So if there's a claim, they pay out the damage. And they're very good companies. They're not uh, Ranger uh, from Amsterdam who has a <laughs> bit of money in his uh, back pocket to pay out claims. It's not working like that. But I'm the broker um, in between the insurance company and the client. And it's my job to to make both parties happy, let's say. Yeah. Um, but it's funny, man. I, um, I, I have a guy in Pakistan now who's watching every YouTube video around the world about crashing. Oh, yeah? So he's writing down all the details that I told him to to uh, to write down um we did many championships already so we got all the data Dries, you're in it you're in the data oh yeah you know exactly for sure what you did. so my you quote I... coming from you next week is not going to be very good then if he watches <laughs> youtube <Yeah. on> <laughs> exactly so no it's, it's interesting just to build up a business and um i think you know data is key at the moment in uh, in, in the world anyway but also for us to show exactly the insurance company who is a good risk and who is not um, and, uh, <laughs> I don't think I'll ever get one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so that's how it works. But um, yeah, it's. Um, what it's, if you crash yourself? Uh, that's double the pain. Yeah. I, <laughs> so I tell you a story. Once in uh, Paul Ricard, I, uh, I was driving with an amateur in the car and uh, in a Mercedes. And I drove from, I think we started like 25th, and I drove all the way to 7th. I overtook a car that I insured and I took no risk, of course. <laughs> then the car in front of me was insured by me as well. <laughs> but on top of that, the driver was Thomas Jaeger, who was also kind of important on the driver's decisions within Mercedes. So I overtook a car that I insured. My car was insured with me and the car in front of me was a guy who was deciding about my seat plus his car was insured. I was like, you know, I'll stay behind. <laughs> <It's okay." laughs> So, yeah, that's sometimes you get in a funny situation. But, yeah, um, yeah, also within Chip Ganassi now, every time there's a car off track, they come on the radio. It's like, did you insure the car? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, it, would be, it would be the strange to race, you know, like, oh, fuck, I can't overtake that car. Ooh, yeah, I hope I don't touch him. I mean, that we are in a luxury, talking about motorsport and young guys, we are now all in the luxury that if we crash, I mean, you never score good points, but you don't have to pay the bill. But I remember this year going to Macau, Earl was there with his own team. And I think I, I, I had to do it. Like, I had to do a bit of Formula One style. Like before qualifying, I'm like, who pays the bill when you crash it? <laughs> he said, uh, I pay it myself. Said, oh, I bet you're going to suck and qualify <laughs> now. <laughs> 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 well, yeah. I had to do it. But it's, it's, for me also, it's really cool. You know, Earl is uh, one of the clients from yeah. Pocona, let's say. And he's obviously your friend. He's your friend. He, mm. You know how cool Earl is. And, it's nice to work with people from you guys that you raced against with or still sure. racing with, and you can start already doing some business together. It's pretty, uh, yeah, I it's, find it really cool. It's different if I have to call you for something or I have to call some guy on a, a desk at an insurance company, yeah. which I've never seen or spoke of it. So yeah, definitely. And it's a great business because you all, I mean, once uh, the day comes that we all probably have to call the day uh, you've got a perfect business to continue that for the next years because motorsport i mean i hope at least anyway i think it will be going for m many more years you've got a business that will sort you out until the well until you are fed up with it <laughs> i guess yeah yeah no, no for sure it's something on the side but it's also it's it's, it's very yeah. equal in terms of you know energy and all that but mm. um yeah it's for sure cool to have something running already before you uh before you stop but uh it's quite interesting, you know, my teammate Sebastian Bourdais, who, uh, who is amazingly fast, by the way, he's one of the best teammates I've ever had. Uh, mm -hmm. He's 45, you know, so yeah. that gives me some... Uh, yeah, no, for sure. I'm 38 in February. That gives me some, uh, some mood going forward because he, uh, he's, he's still super focused and fit. And I think everybody who, if you look at people who stop racing or 
going over the hill, it's when they stop trading. Um, it's a, it's a mental, jumping. it's a mind, mindset thing. There's no proof in the world that when you're 40, you're getting slower. It's, it's all no. about the mindset you have and, and the mentality and, and the will, the, the motivation. And I think it's also special in IMSA. They are more loyal for a longer time and don't really look at the age yeah. number as much as probably Europe does. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. let's see. You also, since I think a year, maybe two years own a, a coffee shop in Amsterdam, right? Because we actually, I, I wouldn't have, we spoke about chocolate. Wait, too. wait. Oh. Yeah, coffee if you shop? say coffee shop in, a, in, in Amsterdam or in Holland, it's a different story, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yes, you can a, drink coffee It's a coffee there. bar or a coffee <laughs> shop. That's two different things. And maybe you own both, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I wouldn't be racing anymore then, but uh, no, a coffee shop for the people at home is where they sell weed marijuana and those kind of stuff. That's like, why uh, you said stuff. it. That's why you asked. <laughs> yeah, want, maybe Dries, he yeah. thought it was a coffee shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why he wants to come back. Exactly. <laughs> you want some of those beans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the coffee bar is, uh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So the coffee bar. We wanted to come by and we will come by at one point because we want to visit Amsterdam. It's a very good gluten-free bakery there as well. Um, <laughs> how is that going? Because I've been saying that for years. Um, I don't think it's a multi-billion business, but it's something I no. really want to do at one point, a coffee bar with a, with a bike shop and, and some, some healthy acai bowl stuff. And, uh, I have to come and visit it because I think it's cool, but is it, is it, is it a fun business to have? Is it, is it a business or is it more yeah, a fun thing? <clears throat> Obviously with the travel that we do, you need to have good partners because, um, you know, you need to be there every day. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've got two guys from Australia, actually, who, uh, who I know from, who live in Amsterdam for many years now, who are really into coffee. You know, in racing, we have the Pro-Am lineup. So normally we are the Pro, mm -hmm. you have an M who brings the money. But in the coffee <laughs> bar, it's different. I'm the M and they are the Pros. Yeah. <laughs> so um, they, we, we all own 30% of the, or like one third of the, of the company. And uh, they run the, the show daily to daily. They roast their own beans. They, um, okay. they are... You know, it's such a niche, niche thing, what yeah. I like about it. You know, the racing insurance is a niche thing. Racing is, is a niche thing. And the coffee thing is another niche or biking is another niche. You know, yeah. it's, I, I love those little, you know, nerds, uh, mm. coffee nerds or biking nerds yeah. like you are, Lawrence. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. And um, they run the show daily to daily. It's not a good business right now because the, the rent of the place is very high. The labor costs are super high at the yeah. moment. So... I wouldn't say we're making uh, loads of money, but um, I think better times will come in a, in a couple of years or something. And yeah. uh, we're hanging in there nicely. Um, and I find it really cool to, uh, to, to, to be busy with that on the side, you know? So uh, that's how it is. We'll come by one day. Maybe, maybe even yeah. before we go to the tour, because we've been speaking about it for months, but now is actually the only real chance to, <laughs> to do that. Yeah. Um, so before, and before Amsterdam is nice. If, uh, it's a nice, nice city, so you can yeah. make a weekend out of it or whatever. I thought by going by bike there and then Jacqueline uh, driving. No, I wouldn't, wouldn't do it. That's my bike. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is with Amsterdam uh, as well, people ask me why you're not living in the U.S. because I'm racing in the U.S. so many years yeah. now. And, uh, and it's just, we love it here. Um, the airport is 15 minutes away. Mm -hmm. From here you can go mostly It's a good everywhere. airport. I fly and often from there as well. Right, yeah. And ever, whenever you have a layover, I can pick you up for a coffee. So um, you let me know. Yep. But it's, um, oh, you actually drive to Amsterdam. Yeah, most of the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's, 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 it's one of those cities where it's kind of small. We do everything on the bike. I never use the car, never. Um, yeah. And uh, it's cozy. My kids like it here. They have a bit of a friends. And we don't have any family here, but we have friends. And we, uh, we you know, from here, I, uh, I wouldn't like to live anywhere else to be honest but uh, the only thing is in holland at the moment the weather is so bad mm. yeah, same here it's Horrible. uh that's when i think about moving but yeah. uh, in the summer yeah. it's really cool yeah. actually just remember uh, it's covid what three four years ago that we uh we had to stay i think for travel stories we we had to stay for four or five weeks almost in 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 america not to travel back because there was uh six weeks um, travel ban yeah. yeah travel ban so we stayed in the house first it was Earl which was there for a couple of weeks with us so we rented an Airbnb in the Neden it was Jacqueline and Emily 
and then later uh, a Rangers joined us, I think, for like a week or even more. Yeah, I think uh, I think one and a half week. Yeah. we stayed together. And we yeah. did all the cycling rides, the group rides, and we were. I mean, we were pretty good at that. I was in, I was in good shape. You were in good shape. So we were. I remember that one ride on Saturday where I, I told the rank it was a big ride. It was all the guys do the was like the the national criterium champion was there or yeah or from <laughs> Florida no no Florida sorry not, not over there. and I told the Ranger like it was three loops and one loop was probably I don't know half an hour one lap and I said to Ranger I said Look, that guy if he goes pay attention because he's he's like fucking strong first lap I think thirty percent through the first lap that guy goes. I looked left to me, Ranger follows him. Like, fuck. <laughs> I didn't mind following, but okay, here we go. <laughs> so I followed Ranger, and then we looked, we were with a group of, of six, I think. And then there's every lap, there's normally a sprint. And I was like, okay, this is going to be half a lap, but he was going like flat out. I mean, for us, it was flat out staying in the wheel. Flat out. Uh, and then we come to the sprint, and I was like, okay, now we'll bunch back up. Uh, he kept going. <laughs> And we spent like three laps in the breakaway with that guy, and then we survived. I think we finished second and third, and, yeah, and we did, even yeah. in the Criterium uh, amateur race. And we kept on cycling. I remember the last day we woke up at six in the morning. We were looking at each other on the bike, like we should take a break. <laughs> we kept on. Yeah. yeah, honestly, man, I had white white dots in front of my eyes when we <laughs> that morning when we went for the eighth day in a yeah. row flat out. <laughs> I had these white dots in front of my eyes, like a, I don't know, a hangover or a <laughs> headache or whatever it was. I was like, "What are we doing here?" Like, okay, you know. But it was fun. But I was that was the fittest biking I've I've ever been because I think I the more you bike, the better you get. Yeah, yeah. So, and then the next day he he comes up and he says, "Hey, Ringer, there's this criterium <laughs> uh, next to the airport. You know what? We'll just go there. We'll watch." Yeah. And maybe if <laughs> we like it, we we join the race. And of course, we went yeah, racing flat we, out. We sprinted for the finish. That <laughs> <laughs> no, was fun, but it also shows like because people maybe don't know this, they only know us from racing against each other. And obviously, we speak the same language, but we often all spend time together at some point um, during yeah, sure. during the season and during our career. So um, it's funny how how close it's funny. it is. The funny thing is you, you say we speak the same language, but it's interesting, like, uh, you have had made a career out of racing. I made a career, you know, how difficult it is. Dries knows how difficult it is. And you kind of like have, a uh, an energy of talking, yeah. and you know what it's about. You don't have to explain each other what you've exactly yeah. tried to achieve and are doing and all that. So, you know, I always try my friends to explain what I like about racing. And one of the things is what I really like is when you're on top of the pit wall, you haven't been driving for one day. Your car is in the lead in Daytona for the biggest race of the year. He comes in and that's the moment with all the pressure on to jump in the car, get all your seat belts done and go out. You know, those kind of pressure moments we yeah. all go through. Yeah. Um, and it's hard to explain to people who don't uh, experience that, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, and there's so many more racing moments where that's what we do it for that's why we race that's what we love you know to go and have that pressure and it's um it's people like you and reese um that feeling it's the same feeling we get and it's hard to explain to people who don't yeah, exactly. but, um, that's why you kind of speak the same language yeah so we have one last question from uh, an anonymous listener i don't know if he actually listens kind of a story that you go to, you try to go Skinny dipping in Florida? Or try to go swimming <laughs> in the sea in Florida? Yeah, what was that again? Um, yeah, I almost got arrested or something. <laughs> 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 yeah, what was it again? Do you know it? Do you, no, no, I re generally don't know it. I know who asked the question, obviously, but ex teammate of yours, you insure him. Yeah, he has a team. Huh? No? <laughs> Earl. Earl? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Last last year in the <laughs> <laughs> So we're in the house in Daytona last year, 2020. This year actually. And uh no last year. No this year. This year. And uh it was me, Alex Lynn, um, Richard Westbrook and Earl in one house on the beach. And in the morning I was like, you know, six in the morning it was still the sun coming up. I'll go for a early wake up. 
uh, swim in the sea. And uh, there was this apartment building right there next to it, which I like looked very empty. Apparently it was full of people. Um, <laughs> and uh, I said to these guys, I said, so I was already butt naked. I was like, hey guys, I'm going to go for a swim. See you later. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 don't do that. You're going to get arrested because obviously that's not allowed in, uh, in Daytona. And uh, they told all the team. And since then, uh, I'm the, the naked cowboy uh, going for skiing. <laughs> so I kind of remember you that from the house and Dean as well. You didn't mind running yeah. around, not completely naked, I hope, because <laughs> my wife was there. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Crazy Dutch guy. Yep. Thank you for joining. I think that was very interesting. I think uh, yes. a lot of stories about your career in general, which uh, people would love to hear. Mm -hmm. um, so I appreciate the time you took on second Christmas Day, Ranger. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks to you guys. I think it's nice. You, you, you guys are doing a cool job. So, uh, and we, with Pagoda, we have a, um, it's amazing. We started amazing. Uh, we started a Instagram profile on the 1st of January and we're already at 90 K followers. Yeah. So. so I'm happy to share this over there as well. Uh, yeah. or, or whenever you have cool stories, send it over and we'll post it. So that's like also a cool account to follow because you use all the, the crazy, funny, strange motorsport moments and videos. So it's a, it's a cool account to follow yeah. for everyone who's listening. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Thanks guys. And uh, see you next Thanks, time. Thanks, Ranger. Yep. Enjoy your time with your family and uh, see you in a couple of weeks, I guess. Don't eat too much for the race Sounds next good. month. <laughs> <laughs> Stop drinking, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> why does everybody, <laughs> look, why does it look so obvious for everyone? I did this listener <laughs> Q&A question yesterday and that popped up a couple of times as well. No way. <laughs> there was one question that you ever jump in the car with alcohol left in your blood. <laughs> more towards you than me i guess <laughs> <laughs> all okay right i go cycling I go. all right guys see you <laughs> ciao, later. Ciao. Ciao. thanks for the time ciao, ciao.